Hello and welcome. This is um, Storytelling and Resilience. I'm glad that you're here. I'm Elizabeth Dialdinas. I work at the Smithsonian American Art Museum and I have a co-facilitator today. Hi, I'm Stephanie Fry. I use she, her, hers pronouns and I work at Capitol Jewish Museum um, and this is one of the events is part of our groundbreaking festival. I'll go ahead and drop that link for you all in the chat if you want to check out any of the other things we've been doing. But we are building a museum, so we're excited to be doing partnerships with people like Elizabeth um, as we start our journey into the city. Wonderful, thank you. So um, as I said at the start, we're really going to be digging into this idea of how story can storytelling can become a tool through which we gain our own. Um, resilience or gain patterns to follow that bring us toward resilience. Um, and so beginning with Maya Angelou, I feel like is a beautiful um, frame. I can be changed by what happens to me, but I refuse to be reduced by it. So really thinking about the cognitive moves, the emotional work, the intellectual work um, that we are able to do to kind of shift the frame or focus, um, knowing that really challenging, stressful, traumatic, awful things can happen in a lifetime. Um, and recognizing that when we start to use storytelling as a tool, we may be able to negotiate um, a kind of a, a way around and through. Um, to make it really practical and linked particularly to the classroom, an example that I found on the Cult of Pedagogy, which is kind of a go-to blog for me, um, is a woman who was reflecting on um, a very simple frame. So she was saying, um, if a student rolls their eyes at you, you have this moment of choice. And in that moment of choice, it could be, oh, this student doesn't respect me. Or alternatively, and this takes a lot of growing up, but that's the growing I'm trying to do. Alternatively, one could say, ah, oh, 12 year olds, that's kind of typical of what 12 year olds do. Um, I'm going to move on to the next part of the lesson. Um, and the thing that I really appreciate that's emphasized in this particular post is in that moment, if we can hone our ability to expand the space between what happens and how we respond to it and interpret it, we have so much more power to cultivate our resilience. So again, just really trying to connect this idea of the stories we tell ourselves, the stories we tell each other are ways for us to uh, negotiate really stressful experiences. Um, so I wanna build a bridge between that idea into a kind of a practical application. And what we're gonna do together is look at an artwork and take the artwork apart with the intention of looking for the story inside it then we're going to reflect on what is the story the artist is telling, what's kind of the mood or flavor of the story, and if we presented a student with such a story or an artwork, how might that story or artwork serve as a pattern um, or a compass for a student who's facing a similar challenge or just a challenge period, um, so recognizing some kind of human connections. So. Um, the artwork on the left, before you type anything in the chat box, I'm going to ask you to just look at really slowly. Um, if it's a useful tool to you, please do listen to my prompts. If it's not useful to you, feel free to just black out my voice. Um, but I'm going to invite you to imagine that your eyes are like a scanner or a paintbrush. And imagine that you could reach out with them and touch every part of this painting. Um, I often start in the top left because I'm an American English reader and so I start at the top left um, and I just pan my eyes across the top of the frame to the top right corner of the frame and then I might brush my eyes all the way down the rightmost side of the painting and from the bottom right I might move my eyes from the right to the left and then I might move my eyes all the way back up to the top and then fill in the middle part um, with my kind of imagination or my, um, my seeking. Um, and just remind myself that everything on here is a choice. So the artist chose to portray actually herself in this particular painting in a particular way. So even if it was a happy accident, she chose for it to be this way. So now that we've looked all over the artwork, if you would please in the chat box make as long a list as you possibly can of just the parts of the story. What is it that you see? Will you type some things into the chat box, please?
and some looking at the stars. Thank you for starting us off, Liam. I appreciate it. You got relationships all of a sudden. I appreciate that too. Two youth and blue and red, a roof girls and mom. The light, thank you for noticing the light in the night sky. Jessica says preparing for bed, pointing the moon. Mom is folding the sheets and the children are on the roof looking at the moon, trying to make wishes. What a wonderful idea, I love this. What can you add? What are some more things that you see? Ashley's noting, this is kind of dangerous. I appreciate that, yes. <laughs> Although, if I had to be honest, in this period of confinement, sitting on the roof does sound really lovely. <laughs> What have I missed in the chat box, Stephanie? Um, we're also talking a lot about the daffodils and, and the trees themselves. So we're looking at the fact that you, we've all decided, or a lot of us have decided that they are daffodils. Um, okay. I think it's interesting to you. Okay, great. Thank you. Ah, Laura's just started to think about when do daffodils bloom? It might be cold on the roof if they live here because March is not the time to sit on the roof. I love this. So when we start to use the chat box, this is me teacher talking, you know, when we start to use the chat box as a place where people are both putting ideas and then also building on each other's ideas, you could scroll back through and see, for instance, if we were looking for a demonstration of understanding, you could scroll back through the, the chat box and think at the start, we were just saying kind of like, dot, 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 dot. And then as we moved along together, I've noticed that your contributions are getting longer and more detailed. So like, just think about how the chat box can be a tool for you um, in the virtual classroom. Um, okay, so now we have kind of the parts of the story, right? We have all the bits. Um, Anne is noticing that there's uh, a cross in the window, for instance, and Ashley's thinking about the idea of the time of the month and thinking about the full moon. And so we're really starting to generate um, kind of a collective thinking about the parts. What I'm going to do right now is just give you like the teeniest little smidge of information. The painting is titled Camas para Sueños. That's the title that the artist gave it. And the translation is Bed for Dreams. Um, the artist's name is Carmen Lomas Garza. And she painted this in 1985. And at the time she painted this, she was 37 years old. So as I said before, it's an autobiographical painting to some degree, but she's looking back over her lifetime. So we have like this little smidge of additional information. Um, with that additional smidge of information, I'm gonna ask you to think about the parts, uh, the, the, the role that each part seems to play in the story. So like, we're not even telling the story quite yet. We're just trying to figure out like, what are these parts doing um, within the context? So I'm, before we do that, I need you all to nominate the five most important parts of this artwork. So will you jot in the chat box like your vote for the most important part of this artwork? Oh, thank you for the correction. Yeah. Lisa corrected so us <laughs> beds, plural, for dreams. I appreciate it. Okay, so Alexis says the rooftop component seems to be very important. So we're going to hold on to that. That's one. I need four more things on the list. Whoa, it just exploded. I love it. I'm seeing the moon come up twice. Okay. And so is mom. The mom is important. Okay. So I've got to write this down. This is how my brain works anymore. Rooftop. Moon, mom, moon um, children. 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 We have some of them, the pointing. Um, and then the cross has also been mentioned twice. Okay, great. So we were already thinking about the daffodils and the moon as kind of like indicators of time of year or time of month. So what does the rooftop perhaps stand for? And I think Alexis has already kind of like previewed that for at least my thinking, but what does this rooftop space stand for? Will you jot some ideas in the chat box? The past. Ooh. Interesting. Uh, Laura, you're saying the rooftop is a bed? Talk to me about that. A platform for the future. What a beautiful poetic oh. phrase. Freedom um, in a bed for dreams, escaping to new worlds or looking to the future. These are great. I definitely think that I felt that the rooftop felt like an escape, like it was kind of dangerous, but really exciting as a child to be on the rooftop. Yeah, yeah, for sure. 
the future. Okay, beautiful. So we've got this, we have the idea of what is the rooftop. What about that moon, that big full moon? What is that? What does that stand for? Hopes, dreams. Oh, mother. The, the moon as the mother too. How interesting. I love that layer. Oh, possibilities. Cool. So thinking about like the artist could have chosen a waxing or a waning moon, but this full moon um, makes me, I'm, you're, you're giving me a gift. I haven't really considered that before. Really appreciative. Okay. So now if the moon could be the mother, who's this mom in the house? Like what does she stand for for you guys? And Lisa's adding la luna, feminine energy and wholeness. Thank you. So who's this mom? The earthly mother. So we have a heavenly mother and an earthly mother. I love this. Oh, Alexis, reality. I love that. Oh, Durbin's the moon is where you can see dreams that you can imagine. Yeah. That's good. The spiritual and the profane. Um, the mother, the earthly mother being about love and security and reality and tradition and nurturing. I love this. But also very everyday. Okay. Perfect. How about the children? So they're occupying, they're the only occupants of this space, this in-between launch pad platform for the future, freedom, danger space. What, what role are they playing in the artwork? They're desiring. They're the center. They're the middle. Okay. They're the center part of the story. They're bringing energy. They have all the time in the world. I love this idea. There's this like beauty of youth of just kind of like every afternoon feels like 20 years long um, and they just can dream then. Okay. What am I missing, Stephanie? I'm sure a million things. Um, thinking outside the expected and this ability to, to dream and, and the sense of adventure of being up on the roof. Okay. Laura suspended between two worlds. Okay, so then we've got earthly mother, heavenly mother, and then we have the, the earthly mother is in the space next to this Christian cross that you mentioned at the beginning as being important. Um, what does that cross stand for in this particular story? Belief and tradition. Connection. Okay. Grounding, ideals, prescribed roles. The father's not in the scene. Oh, maybe it's a sign signifier of loss. What an interesting idea. Cool. The unseen. Okay, so next question for you. What is the mood? So like, if you wanted to, don't do it now because we don't have enough time because I'm terrible at managing time. But if you could scroll back through the chat box, you might start to think about the word choice that you've used. So you've used particular words to describe this particular artwork. What is the mood, like the flavor of the words that you've chosen? And like, what is the mood and flavor of the artwork? So what, what is the mood of the story for you? You put an idea in the chat. Hopeful is coming through and heartwarming, optimistic, serene, commonality. I love this. So that idea of connection being really important, calm, suspension in time, okay. safe and still. So it's like this kind of like, it's a resting place, but also a launching place, which is a really interesting um, dichotomy. Um, so last query for you. If you were going to ask the artist a question, what would you need? What would you want to ask the artist in order to better understand the story that this artwork is telling? So just shoot an idea um, into the chat box, if you will. What's a question that you would have for the artist to kind of check your understanding?
what is the relationship between these girls on the roof? <laughs> <laughs> Who are these people? This is fair. Oh, I like this question. Does the mother know the girls are up there? Why the cross? Where's the father? What, is this? what are they dreaming about? How did they get up there? These are, we have some practical questions. We, we need yes. to know a little bit more about the mechanics of this house. It sounds like <laughs> Victoria is asking, is it painted from memory? Did they see constellations? So beautiful. So now I'm inviting you into this kind of questioning space where we're recognizing that probably there's something we don't understand that we need to understand, but also that we can start to find kind of um, crinolations that we can kind of pull apart and expand the story if we have a little bit more information. Um, I'm gonna give you a little information. And as I do, I'm gonna ask you to go back to that thinking sheet where you've kind of got this story that you've told and idea about resilience. Um, as I read this, this bit of information for you, my invitation for you is just to note down the challenges that Carmen Lomas Garza faced in her lifetime. So in the time between she paint, when she was born and when she painted this artwork, 37 years. Um, so we're gonna kind of look at this period and I'm gonna ask you to note the challenges on that piece of paper. So Carmen Lomas Garza said, I wanted to be a professional artist. And I also made the decision that I would probably not have children because I could see from having to help take care of my younger brothers and sisters that it takes a lot of energy devotion and sacrifice to raise children. And I knew that to create your artwork takes about the same kind of thing. She made this painting about herself, as I said, she was 37 years old when she made it. And in between the time of her youth that we see depicted here and the time that she painted the picture, she'd gone to the University of Texas. She'd worked super hard as a studio assistant and teacher there. She'd been reprimanded for playing Spanish music and speaking Spanish to her students. And ultimately she was dismissed because she did not stop a student walkout in support of Chicano rights. And at that moment, Garza said, or decided, um, I wanted my artwork to address and focus on the Mexican American community. And I wanted us to celebrate our history, our culture, our music, our art, our dress, our language, everything about us. So what she started to do was go back to cherish childhood memories and then she would celebrate those memories um, through her work. So you've noticed that there were some challenges in the in-between and I'm gonna invite you to think about resilience. So getting a little um, moment of pause. She had all these challenges. Before we start to identify points of resilience, let's just establish a shared understanding of what resilience is. So according to the American Psychological Association, resilience is the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or even significant sources of stress. And that's like a big, big idea, and we'll, we'll come back to that. You'll see this definition again. But what I want to do is kind of highlight three important takeaways when we're starting to think of ways that we can become resilient or practice resilience. Um, I'm going to read the three takeaways, and I'm going to ask you to kind of go back in your mind to the painting, back to the life of the artist as has been described so far. Um, when we are resilient, we look at obstacles, challenges, and failure as part of success. When we are resilient, our relationships are a source of strength. And when we are resilient, stories help us make a whole out of sometimes painful parts. So, looking back at our painting as our starting point, think to yourself, how does this artwork offer us Evidence of resilience, now that we know a little bit more about it, about her, about the definition of resilience. So just think about that for yourself. And then recognizing that this artwork could stand as a story that offers both connection, and I think we found some really um, deep connections, important connections. Um, in addition to connection, how might this story or this artwork story um, also serve as a compass for students who are facing hard decisions? 
And when you've got an idea and answer to that, would you jot it in the chat box, please? How might the story, as we see it depicted here, serve as a compass for students who are facing hard decisions? And to teacher talk to you again. This is always the moment when I panic because I'm like, nobody's threading anything in the chat box. And I feel like I need to start yammering. Um, but just to call it out, I just asked you a mighty huge question. So I need to give you the wait time to be able to answer it. So even though I'm panicking inside, the think time is important. What do you see coming through, Miss Stephanie? Um, the sacrifice of the mother in order for children to dream um, or the, the two figures on the roof seem to actually sharing the two figures on the roof seem to be finding joy in their space regardless of what is happening in the house. Seeking of joy. Yeah. Thinking of joy. Laura, Laura Green. Now we have two Laura's with us um, is talking about looking at the sky and hope again. So we're referencing that once again that we had kind of talked about at the beginning. I like the idea of being true to yourself and then also asking for help, right? Like the idea that an artist just magically becomes an artist all by themselves, that how would you ever be an artist? That seems like an insurmountable um, mountain to climb, right? But if we ask for help, if we recognize that Carmen Loma Scarza not only had help, but then also had to make a really hard decision about not having children in order to achieve her goal, like there's kind of a lot there. Lisa's adding being true to her values versus not getting in trouble at school, having to decide between children and her true voice, the importance of faith. Faith lives a foundation, right? So we're seeing these two um, sisters sitting on top of a, a house as a kind of a foundation that is about this cross in that we were talking about. Garza was able to dream and move forward because of the support of her family on her mother's shoulders. And then Kate adds challenges plus resiliency equals growth. Beautiful. So we have this like starting point, right? Um, and I am going to make just a really brief connection because I want to turn the microphone over to Stephanie, but I wanted to offer you, if you are a language arts teacher or if you need to, uh, just a, a visual to hold the idea of how, well, this is all great, but like how do I connect this to actual content that I'm responsible for teaching? Um, I would offer that the painting that we just looked at gives us a way to deconstruct a complex text that is a little bit more accessible for students, particularly students who aren't comfortable yet um, fully vis um, full with that kind of expansive poetic literacy, right? Um, but then you've got this pattern. This is how I dissect a complex artwork. Ah, now I have a complex text. Maybe I can apply the same. So um, I really appreciate Nikki Giovanni's um, semi-autobiographical poem called Nikki Rosa because basically what she is doing is reflecting on her life and thinking about the way that one might tell her life story as opposed to how would she tell her life story and I offer it here as kind of a, a pendant piece to the painting that we just looked at but I think that um, what Giovanni encapsulates really beautifully follows in the last four lines of this poem. Um, she says, black love is black wealth, and they'll probably talk about my hard childhood and never understand that all the while I was quite happy. So I offer that as both a connection to how do we start to uncover moments of resiliency or, or texts that demonstrate resilience in the classroom. But then also, um, I think with her work, she's challenging us to recognize that the the stories we tell about other people are also creating patterns of thought for our students. And so it might be very important that students receive stories that are not just about the hardship, but also about um, the resilience. So that's my quick connection for you. And I'm going to pass it over to Stephanie. So um, we talked a little bit how we, we've looked at an art piece that shares the story of resilience and we also just talked about a literary figure in a way that English language teachers can bring that into their classroom. But we're going to switch gears a little bit and also look at a historical figure. Um, and historical figures can be people who are with us. They can be people who have passed. Um, and they don't have to just be in that history, social studies field. They can be engineers and scientists and artists, and, and they can really range a, a variety of topics. You can find ways to incorporate that into your classroom um, beyond just the, the traditional sort of history book um, timeline that we look at. 
So we're going to start and we're going to look, um, look out and then we're going to, we're going to zoom in. So if we look at this, um, what I want you to do in the chat is I just want you upon your first look and your first glance, sorry, to, it's okay <laughs> to draft out, um, to jot down what stands out to you. So what do you notice right away? I notice um, Sonia Sotomayor smile quickly. Alexis is noticing limited diversity. Amy's building on the idea of Justice Sotomayor not only smiling, but also leaning toward the camera. Isabel's noticing that there are quite a lot of older people in this picture. <laughs> Um, Sotomayor, Ginsburg, white man, one black man, red tie, black robes, red curtain, and Anne as the notorious RGB. Um, go ahead and, and look a little bit closer and, and take a second look and how Elizabeth was sharing, you want to kind of scan and, and look closer at what you're seeing. Um, and think about why is, why are those things that we noticed at first, why is that what we noticed first? What is it that made that come to your attention. Amy's adding height differences and the subtle bling. I like this idea of this subtlety. Um, Ashley's noticing peaks at personality, so ties and jewelry, thinking about the way that we adorn ourselves, demonstrate something about us. <laughs> I appreciate your honesty, Isabel. She, she says, I'm getting old too. Yep. Charlotte's noticing how important it is to recognize the lens of prior knowledge. So when we know something, we can see it sometimes a little bit more clearly or more quickly. Exactly. So thank you so much for all of those things. Um, we, we start to notice, and, and we're doing that thing right now where I'm starting to feel like I need to fill this with chatter, <laughs> and I'm completely guilty of that and, and the wait time. At the most powerful, they don't look at or their age and they don't look as old as I once thought they did. You notice their posture. Um, so we're noticing these things first and, and oftentimes when we encounter images like this, one of the Supreme Court and a, and a bench full of people that we might know something about or we think that we know a little bit about but maybe our, our perceptions have changed. Um, these, these images often entice us to make these snap judgments or decisions about what we should think or how we should feel or how we should act. Um, and our past decisions and our life circumstances and the challenges that we have faced lead us to make these choices that we did today. So um, our prior knowledge, our unconscious bias, all those things are kind of leading into it. So we're gonna look a little bit closely um, at one member of the Supreme Court and we're going to look at how she um, has demonstrated her resilience and faced with challenges and how she makes the choices that she makes. So Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, or Justice Ginsburg, was born in Brooklyn in 1933. So right as the Great Depression is kind of roaring in. Um, and her mother really instilled a, a love of education for her and was a huge inspiration in her life. In fact, her mother forewent um, college in order to provide for her brother um, to, so they could pay his college expenses. And unfortunately for um, Justice Ginsburg, her mother passed away with, due to cancer the day before she graduated high school. And that could have been like a really traumatic moment for her and, and ended her route of education, but it didn't. And she pushed on and then attended Cornell University. And while she was there, she met her husband. And after they graduated a year later, they began a family and he was drafted into military service. And during that time, when he came back, she started her first year at Harvard Law, but he was also diagnosed with cancer. And so now she's juggling her first year at Harvard Law, keeping her husband up to date on, on his studies and what he needs to be doing battling the challenges of motherhood and all the while facing the inequities that are at Harvard Law School and, and in general, um, the country at the time due to the fact that she's a woman. So she was one of nine women in a 500 person class at Harvard Law and she was constantly chastised for taking a man's spot. 
um, and how dare she and the fact that she is still at the top of her class. She's, she's constantly battling these things. And, and even when she graduated, she continues to face gender inequities in the workplace and made it difficult for her to find a job occasionally. Um, and in the 1960s, she starts to gain national attention for her Lily Ledbetter case, which was a case um, where they went to the Supreme Court and they were fighting for equal pay in the workforce. Unfortunately, they lost um, and it was the justices decided that it was not a case of discrimination, but that didn't stop Justice Ginsburg. She litigated sex discrimination courses, cases, sorry, not courses, for the American Civil Liberties Union um, and was instrumental in launching its Women's Right Project in 1973. She continued with the ACLU until 1980 when President Carter appointed her um, head of appointed her to the District Court of Appeals in DC. And then in 1993, President Clinton appointed her to the Supreme Court and she took her seat on the bench in August and has been there ever since. Um, but that, that didn't stop any of the inequities that have come to her. And she's become a bit of a pop culture icon. As we mentioned earlier, the, we see the notorious RBG. Um, and so while she's known for for her stance and, and her collars and her dress. She's also spoken out <laughs> about presidents, which is not something that people who sit on the bench can do. Um, and so she, she faces discrimination about that and people are very upset. And then she's also um, a woman who, who is still facing these gender inequities. So even being a woman on the bench doesn't stop you from being interrupted by men. And there was a study done that showed that in 2015, there are three women on the bench, they make up a third of the court, and 69% of the interruptions that happen are directed towards the women. And so she's still, she's still doing this. And so once again, I just wanna look at the definition of resilience and Resilience is the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or even significant sources of stress. Um, that's what the American Psychological, Psychological Association has said, and that's the definition we're using today. So how is she resilient? How has she been demonstrating her resilience over these years now that we've gone down a backstory? Just as a teacher talk moment while you're thinking, because this is another great example of a big, beautiful question that needs a little um, digestion time. This could be an opportunity to, if you were doing something like this, invite your students to scroll back. I've been taking notes in the chat box. So just as a tip, if um, students don't process um, uh, particularly well auditorially, then the chat box can be a place of documentation and, and um, reference. <laughs> Charlotte notes adversity did not stop her. Um, she never gave up. She's pursuing her work in spite of so many obstacles. She's using her experience to empower others. I love that connection. Thank you, Ashley. Um, she doesn't use the word can't. I really appreciate that also. She doesn't seem to get stuck. Um, she kept going even when the going got tough and she didn't play the victim. I think these are all important. That idea of didn't play the victim and, and that she just kept kept going when she didn't get stuck. She found new ways and new paths to follow. Um, and so all the decisions that she she makes and the things that we know her for are, are based on the challenges that she's already faced in her life. Beautiful. Before we move on, I just wanna see if there are any other yeah. examples. And this is also one of those moments in your classroom where it's great for you to, to turn this back into a social emotional learning opportunity in your classroom. Was there a moment when um, a student was really challenged by something and didn't give up and kept going? That idea that our brains are muscles that keep growing and we, and we keep um, pushing them and retraining them to do things. I think that seeing ourselves as resilient in the same way that we see a historical figure that's really well known is, is important too. It's a great connection. Great. Um, so 
we see that she's in the spotlight a lot in her things. I see that Isabel's putting it in. It seems that if one door closed, she tried a different key. Um, and I think I think that's a great way to put it. Um, that it, it took them a couple tries to get in to get through the different doors that she's opened and and it took women a lot of time to do that and she's one example of that. So her status as, as a pop culture icon continues to bring more controversy to her um, and we could we could talk about her in the way she's faced challenges for a really long time. Um, and she's always in the spotlight, either due to her health recently or to her noteworthy collars. And so we're going to look a little bit closely about at, at her collars. And so in this photo, she's wearing her favorite Jabot collar that was made in Cape Town, South Africa. And she actually wore this to Barack Obama's first joint session of Congress in December, on December 31st in 2005, before he was president. So this is just when he was addressing Congress. Um, and she explained to the Washington Post in 2009 a little bit more about her collars. And since they're so iconic, I, I wanna take some time to dive into that. So she chose to wear the collar in the first place. And here's what she said. You know, the standard robe is made for a man because it has a place for the shirt to show and for the and the tie. So if you're looking at Justice Thomas, you can see that his tie is peeking out just above that opening in the Supreme Court in the robe. And so she says, so Sandra Day O'Connor and I thought it would be appropriate if we included as part of our robe something typical of a woman. So I have many, many callers. So Justice Sandra Day O'Connor was the first woman appointed to the bench. And um, since then, women have kind of worn some sort of feminine piece as a symbol. And um, Justice Ginsburg continues that every once in a while you see Justice Sotomayor and Justice Kagan with those as well, who are the other women on the bench. And we've, we've been told the, these stories about her and they've differed over time. So some people look at this as okay and, and some people don't, but again, this is a story of her and her resilience and how she is, is demonstrating her collar um, as a sign. So if you can click to the next. Thanks. Um, and so let's look really closely at the collar. Um, and I'd love to hear from you. What role do you think that her collar itself plays in being resilient? As people are thinking and writing, I just want to call attention to the beautiful selection of photographs that you chose, Stephanie, because we've seen three different collars of Justice Ginsburg so far. Yeah, this is just a small part of her of her collection. She has hundreds of, of collars, actually, and she has them for different moments. And the one we saw previously was her favorite, and she's famously known for having a descent collar. Um, and this one that we're showing is a crocheted collar. Um, and, and I see that Laura's commenting on it as well. Her response to the male clothing she is forced to wear was to put her spin on it and feminize it. And this is a hand crocheted collar and, that, and that's a fairly feminine thing when you think about textiles and where they've originated in the history of them, but also in, in just how delicate this looks. Mm -hmm. I appreciate also Isabel's making a metaphorical connection to this idea of the collar being circular. It has no beginning or end. It is always going. And that's something that we, <laughs> we were noticing about Justice Ginsburg, just kind of getting up over and over again. Um, and Darren's adding this idea of um, individuality. So having a hundred or however many um, jabos or collars, I'm thinking about like, I am going to individuate myself, not only as the person who wears these kind of collars, but like in, in even further individuation is really interesting. Um, she's not afraid to show feminization of traditional male clothing. It's somewhat in your face. So what an interesting thought that like something that looks to me as traditional as almost like a doily-esque like um, lacy collar could somehow be um, a, like a, a resistance. It's, it's really interesting frame. 
Uh, and Anne is making a connection to an Elizabethan ruff, which was very regal. Um, that's a beautiful uh, sort of claiming of a, of a symbol. Thank you. Yeah, and what a great other sort of statement symbol piece. Um, we know those ruffs really stand out, and I, I feel the her white collars really make a, a statement against that black robe, so you, you notice them. And even when we were looking closely at um, the Supreme Court photo at the beginning and people, it, it struck you immediately what they were wearing and um, you could tell that the notorious RBG, that Justice Ginsburg was part of this photo because you can see her clearly stand out. And I don't remember who it was. If I scrolled back through the chat, I'd be able to um, cite specifically. I apologize. But somebody noticed also that Justice Sotomayor had a kind of a, a glossy um, detail on her robe. So thinking about the yes. many ways that people are um, bringing their full selves, as Laura has said in, in the chat, um, she says, I can't turn off being a woman. So th that's just like, this is who I am. I'm here. Yeah, so we can't, we can't turn off being a woman and, and this is who she is. Um, and so she has this collar, and that's one way that she's outwardly showing her resilience, that she as a woman has made this stand and been able to continue, and she hasn't let any of those closed doors or, or gotten stuck that doesn't stop her. Um, so I want us now to, to think and reflect a little bit. Um, in, additional, in addition to her, to her collar, what are some other ways that Justice Ginsburg has demonstrated her resilience? Is there another outward um, facing thing or symbol. The earrings. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, there's um there there are great photos of her. She will sometimes have very big statement earrings as well. Classic bun. Classic bun, yes. I'm immediately thinking about the Justice Ginsburg workout and like that she is <laughs> hey, Charlotte and I are on the same page. Yeah, that that workout, right? Like that's a, yeah. she's a physically resilient woman. Yes. The mom look when she is displeased. That is so honest. Um, yes, that mom look we all know so well. She doesn't hide it. You know when she is dissenting. So she has that mom look and she has that special dissent collar that she might wear when she is in disagreement with the rest of the court. And Lisa's mentioning even when she's ill, when she's in the hospital, she's she's also continuing to work. She that that work ethic in the face of so many different um, challenges is really pivotal to her the story that we would tell about her. I love all these different um, symbols and, and pieces of her in different ways that we we see her as a resilient figure. Um, and someone who has a, a pretty resilient and, and amazing story of her life. Um, She's 87 at this time, and so she's, she's definitely faced some adversity as we've discussed. Um, so what I think that we can do now is you can take a minute or so, because I'm about, it's another big question, so I wanna make sure you have some time. Um, and you can write either on your own if you wanna keep it to yourself on your paper or in the chat and share with everyone. How might her story of resilience provide a compass for you in this coming year? And while you're doing that, I saw some last minute comments come in from, from Allison um, that was saying how she would love to use to do some of this thinking and ask students about how they might use a piece of clothing as their own sign of resilience, um, which would be a really great activity and like really push them their boundaries and and thinking about your identity as well as to just like your internal ideas of resilience. Um, and Kate shared about her great friendship with Scalia. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate your connection to the sound suit. So, so Nick Cave um, is an artist who um, makes these really just beautifully ornate kind of wild um, works of just accumulated objects and things and the way that they are combined together is really evocative um, and then also he's a choreographer so this is an artist who's making artwork that's meant to be worn and it's just like so it's super I like that connection yeah that was really fun 
I love thinking about other figures through time or when you think of a specific piece of article of clothing and, and they Im immediately tie you to someone. Um, when I see pillbox hats, I still think of Jackie Kennedy. Yes. Um, when I when I see bowler hats, though, I still think of I think of Winston Churchill. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> one piece of clothing, but completely two different wear um, styles and I'm really appreciating something that's happening um, is it, I will call it a mantra. Maybe it's not a good, that's may not be the word that, that you would use, um, Lisa and Laura, but I'm noticing um, don't let them tell you it can't be done. Like this, this is really solid statement. Find a way to do it, modify, but believe in your values. And Laura is adding, don't bow to the low expectations of others, trust who you are. So I love, I love that the, that when we get down to the core, when we get down to kind of the heart of the story that we told about Justice Ginsburg, there is this thing to hold on to. And when we start to think about that kind of transferable heart, the thing that a student could look to and say, ah, I'm nothing like Justice Ginsburg. I don't have the same background or, or education or whatever, but I do see that there's something here that I can hold on to. That's pretty neat. Everything is figure outable. <laughs> yes, I love what Charlotte is saying. That's true. And how her student told her it's not a word, but it is, it is a sentiment. We can, everything has some sort of, of way that we can determine how to, how to go about, how to solve the problem. Yeah. Um, even if it might not have a solution, there is a way that we can figure it out. Yeah. And Darren's thinking about just um, earrings as a symbol of resistance and, and that is a that's a choice that we can all make tomorrow. It's a really interesting point. So my friends, I see that somehow magically, um, thank you, Anne, for the connection, the biblical connection we have Ecclesiastes 3, there's a season for everything. I think that's a beautiful connection to what um, Isabel was saying about the, the, the around and round, the beginning and end, and thinking about um, the world turning. That's an interesting connection for me. Thank you for bringing that. Um, Stephanie, are, are we going to have time to do this reflection? I think so. I think we might have well <sighs> just enough time. So magical. I appreciate it. Um, okay, so I want to challenge you to go back to your own story. So now we've just, we spent some time dwelling together in the idea of framing a story. Um, Carmen Lomas Garza could have told a story in her paintings that was all about the many different ways that she had to make hard choices, um, the ways that her culture um, and language were being actively pushed out of the classroom and the ways that she was discriminated against. Similarly, Justice Ginsburg, we could tell the story of incredible loss and hardship and just zoom in on that component. Um, and, and instead we really looked to the, the many ways that she continued to stand up and over and over again, the sort of indomitable spirit. So if you would go back to the story that you told of yourself at the beginning, and if you didn't, if you didn't do that yet, that's totally fine. All we asked um, the, at the start was you think about a challenge you faced, and if you could tell it as a story that had a beginning, middle, and end, how would you tell that story? Um, you can tell really different stories about the same thing, right? So what is at the heart, right? We said that um, for Justice Ginsburg, one of the hearts was um, don't, bow down, don't bow to the low expectations of others. So what is at the heart of of that challenge story for you, the story that you told about yourself. And once you've distilled down to that, that heart for yourself, how else might you tell the story of that challenge? So deliberately seek a different way of telling that story. And then the next step would be, what's another way to tell that same story? And why would you tell it these different ways? Kind of like, what do you get out of um, the different tellings? Um, so I'm going to give some minutes of silence. I see that it's 4.23. Um, maybe we can do like a four minutes of silence. Does that seem right to you, Stephanie? Yeah. Okay, great.
So we're about halfway through our time, just so you can manage your own progress. can make a suggestion that you start bringing your writing to a close. All right, my friends. So in order to maintain your privacy, my closing query is not what, it, what story did you tell, but rather the, the bigger question that you see at the bottom of the slide. And this is an invitation if you feel like sharing aloud because it would, be, it would get things out a little bit more clearly or, or alternatively because you're not sure how to put it in the chat box, please just put your name in the chat box. But what did you notice as you tried to tell the story multiple ways? Mmm, the easiest way to tell it differently is switching who is the victim and who is the hero. Okay, appreciate that, right? It's a, I like to tell the story that I am always the hero. <laughs> so that is a bias of mine. Um, Lisa's mentioning it came back to the core of being a problem solver and finding surprising benefits. So really thinking about like when we are endeavoring to become resilient or offer students opportunities to become resilient, um, that inviting them into the mindset of being a problem solver um, can be a really powerful way to do that. Thinking about it caused me to grow more positive and strong. Wonderful. Barbara's noticing it's tough to reassess a story that you've been saying the same way for a long time. Thank you for that. That is true, right? Um, I'm super good at telling stories. There's a pretty deep groove in my brain about how things particularly went. Um, and to challenge myself to see it another way, all of a sudden I'm like, whew, why have I been telling it that way for so long? <laughs> um, Anna's go ahead. sharing how there are helpers and to lean on them. So it's, mm -hmm. it's more than just like, I'm usually in the starring role of my story, but there were other people who got me there too. Um, and Teresa shared how that my story is mine and very difficult to share. I had to make yeah. a new character to replace me. So yeah. um, I think I think that shows how personal this can be sometimes and, and how how hard that can be to, to share with others when you're when you're thinking and examining yourself on a under a microscope almost. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Teresa. And what a beautiful coping mechanism that that would also be available to students that to be able to, to look at the story as happening to somebody else to sit beside that story for a minute instead of living it um, could, could offer some space or relief maybe. Yeah. Uh, interesting. So Laura is adding that um, when thinking of a family member facing hardship, the, the opportunities to tell that story different ways also shifted responsibility. Um, and, and they became more successful. That's really interesting. Um, and that it gives you a space to reassess your relationship and the amount of responsibility that you might be um, taking on that may not be for you 
to carry. Um, and Darren's adding, change, change the frame, look through another lens and from a different angle. What a beautiful, I'm going to hold on to that as a closing because that's just like a, yeah, that's, <laughs> thank oh, you. Perfect that you've wrapped that for us. So. <laughs> what a tidy bow. <laughs> um, but I am, I'm really grateful. This is, um, this is a, a, a challenging time to add um, professional development um, to your list of things. And so thank you very much for spending time together. Um, as I said, I am going to send an email as a follow-up with an invitation to offer your feedback and evaluation. There will also be the PowerPoint that we've been looking at together today um, in a Google Drive um, folder. So um, please do be in touch with me if there's anything that I can do to be helpful. Stephanie, what, what is your closing thought? Um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us today and um, taking part in a, in a small piece of our groundbreaking festivals. We start doing more teacher programs and, and classroom programs. Uh, my contact information is there if you need anything um, or want some more teacher tips. I have been in the classroom for a long time before I moved into a museum. And so I, I can only imagine the challenges you're facing in, the, in this new digital world, but um, I I know you're busy and, and professional development's hard on the, on the toughest of normal years. So if we can be a resource for you, please let us know. Thank you, everybody. I'm just gonna um, attempt to end the recording. We'll see if that works out. Um, and if you'd like to stay,